from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. My name is Teresa Pham, and uh, I am a cataloging librarian at the Library of Congress. I have volunteered for the book festival many years, and today I have the pleasure to introduce to you Henry Hotcher and Margaret Eagle. Henry Hotcher is an American actor, boy actor, singer, and author. On Broadway, he had appeared in Beauty and the Beast, uh, Chichi, Chichi Bang Bang, and Mary Poppins. He had done voiceovers for Snow Buddies and Space Buddies. Henry is quite a, a talented performer, and we are so happy to have him here today with us. And Margaret, uh, she is a journalist and playwright. She is also the director of the Alicia Patterson Journalism Foundation uh, and a former Washington Post reporter and editor. Her works include books on baseball and uh, regional foods and the play Red Hot Patriot written with her twin sister, Alison Engel. We have great fun to have her speak here today. So, uh, uh, lady and gentlemen, boy and girls, please welcome Margaret and Henry. Henry. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, children are really natural performers, and they've always loved to get up on stage, but with the emergence of Glee and High School Musical, it's now become somewhat of a mania for children to learn to be performance artists. So when the Disney company asked us to do a book, um, we said yes because Henry Hodges, my co-author, has had a very extraordinary experience in that he had no connection to Broadway or Hollywood. He grew up here in Bethesda, Maryland. But he has worked hard and studied and added new skills to his talent bank. And so we have some real practical how-to information. But one of the things that Henry has learned is how to differentiate himself from other child actors and other actors in general as he's moved into adult roles. So Henry has learned how to do a wave board, how to roller skate. He likes all different types of, of, of ways of transportation. So um, he even now has started with a new form of transportation, which he'll show you right now. Henry. <laughs> this is, of course, a unicycle. <laughs> and Henry has unicycles in various sizes. This one is his endurance unicycle that he's using to go 40 and 50 miles at a time in New York, uh, riding those unicycles. You've got a, a microphone there. Hey, everybody. <laughs> so those of you who are local may have seen Henry in one of his first roles. He was Tiny Tim for two seasons at Ford's Theater in A Christmas Carol. But Henry, why don't you tell them why you didn't get that role the first time around. Uh, well, the first time, oh, there we go, that's better. Well, the, uh, the first time I auditioned for Tiny Tim, um, I was really excited. I went, I went into the room I had prepared for a long time. And uh, I went in and I did my best job. And then I left and then later we found out that um, I didn't get the job because uh, I was too tiny. Uh, I was too small. I was the tiniest person in my class. and. Um, I always was, and uh, that was the reason I didn't get it the first year, and then I was very fortunate to uh, go back and audition again, and uh, then I got it, and I did it two years in a row, and that was sort of my introduction, my professional introduction to theater, and um, I fell in love, and I've been doing it ever since. One of the things that Henry explains in this book is that sometimes your biggest what can seem like your biggest disadvantages turn out to be advantages. <laughs> Henry was small. He also had dyslexia and still does, but he's learned that being 
small for your age is a benefit when you're on stage because you can play older and when you're older you can play younger and that really helps when you're a child actor and you need to rehearse and, and memorize lines. So Henry, bring us, um, bring us towards uh, an understanding of what type of skills you started to learn that you needed when you started uh, your stage career? Um, well, the first skill that I started to learn was um, ballet. I started taking ballet classes uh, when I was about six. Um, and I really loved them because it was just sort of this engaging way to challenge myself that I had never done before. I, I had played soccer and sports, um, but I had never started to acquire a skill um, that was so uh, like historically based. Everything has to be perfect. And um, after I learned ballet, then I started to learn how to tap dance, um, jazz, gymnastics. Um, and then I started to sort of pick up smaller odd skills like the unicycle and the wave board and the rib stick and of course Healy's. Um, I'm also a certified archery instructor and then I started taking fencing classes. So I sort of have an array of mismatched skills. <laughs> And one of the things Henry explained about having all these different skills is when you step into an audition room in New York, you're faced with 50, maybe 80 other young people mm -hmm. who have many other skills too. And so you want to differentiate yourself. But talk a little bit about preparing yourself for an audition and where you need to be mentally and also mm -hmm. physically. Um, well, as an actor and uh, a child performer, there's, uh, you spend a lot more time auditioning uh, than you do working. You audition a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, so it's a big part of it. And um, with auditioning, um, when I was younger, I, uh, I didn't know the difference between, because I started when I was four, I, I didn't know the difference between um, auditions um, and an actual job, um, which was sort of a great mentality to have um, because I was always giving it um, my 100%. Um, and uh, with auditions, I've always found it to be really helpful to um, stay focused. It's very easy to get um, distracted in audition rooms with like your friends there and your cell phone, of course. Um, but um, I've been told that uh, the audition starts when you walk in the room. And um, I've, I've always tried to uh, stay focused. I always bring a Coke with me to sort of keep myself energized. I bring water. I bring a little bit of candy. You know? And I usually bring my dance shoes with me. And sometimes I'll even bring a change of clothes. And uh, I started doing all of those things when I was probably about six. And then I, I, I still do those things to this day. And, I, and every once in a while, when the audition permits, I'll even ride my unicycle there for fun. So I'm, I'm not going to give the whole resume, but once Henry got uh, his job with the first Disney show being Chip in Beauty and the Beast, it was the traveling show. And one thing that you are aware of if you're going to be a child performer who's doing this seriously is that you have to have someone from your family uh, with you because it is obviously not something that you can um, encounter on your own when you're seven, eight, nine. 10 years old. So the sacrifice has to be there somewhat along the lines of a uh, parent working with a, a young child who wants to be in serious sports too. So that commitment is there. And after you did the road show of, of Beauty and the Beast, then talk about going to Broadway for the first time. Um, well, after I left uh, Beauty and the Beast, um, we knew that uh, one ship, the character that I was playing at the time, we knew that one ship was going to be able to go to Broadway. And um, I was done with the tour, and I went on a vacation with my family to the beach. And I think we were there for about a week. And then when we came back from our vacation, there was a message on our, an on our answering machine. We came back late Friday night. And uh, it was the Disney offices asking um, us to call them um, when we got a chance. So we had to wait all weekend, you know, anxiously waiting to see what they wanted to say. Um, and then I remember where I was. I was sitting outside on my swing set in my backyard, and um, and my mom called them and, and asked them, you know, what was up. And they asked uh, if I wanted to do the show on Broadway. Of course, we said yes. And then my mom came out and she told me I was so excited and. Um, I asked her uh, later on if there really were neon lights on Broadway. I really had no idea. Um, I, I, I had heard about Broadway, and everybody in the cast had talked about, talked about it in this sort of holy rail kind of way. And um, I really had no idea what it was. And then I remember we got the car packed up, and I think it was about a week later, 
um, we packed everything up and we went up to New York City. And we were driving through all the traffic uh, and we got there and I was just in complete awe. The tall buildings, so many people. Um, and then I started rehearsals uh, for Beauty and the Beast and then I had my one put in, which is where you get to do the show with, uh, uh, with the cast that's already there. I had my one put in and then I started playing Chip on Broadway. So there are all sorts of special language that goes along with a Broadway show too. Things that I learned uh, that I was unaware of. The kids get the worst dressing rooms <laughs> and these are old theaters and so you might be six and seven floors up and you're coming down the stairs because the older actors don't feel like going up and down. <laughs> You also have to be educated, basically, in the theater. You have classes, and one time Henry uh, had classes by a pool on a touring show. One time he was in a closet, essentially twice, a walk-in closet. Twice, actually. Twice we were in a closet, yeah. <laughs> so um, it's, it's unorthodox, but, but it works. Um, there's also a church on, in Times Square and Broadway that plays... Is it everything's coming up roses? Oh, uh, um, it's... Um, uh, there's no business like no show business. No business like show business. At a half hour every half hour, so you have to know that you're in, in Times Square. But what we tried to do with this book was to talk about some of the pitfalls. There are a lot of scam artists out there very anxious to separate you and your money with expensive photo um, compendiums for your child and also uh, special lessons or, or special, um, the lessons obviously if they're good people are not a waste of time, but um, sometimes they have, uh, enterprises called um, showcases, where mm -hmm. they promise that agents are going to be there or important directors. And maybe you could explain why that's not a good idea most times. Um, well, because it, uh, there's, there's a huge market out there, and um, it's very easy to prey on people who are so, um, who are so uh, starving for um, new information. You know, it's, uh, when, when I first got to New York City, um, my mom and I spent weeks trying to find children's dance classes. I mean, we didn't even know that there were children's dance classes. Of course there are children's dance classes. It's New York City. Um, but there's a lot of, you know, you, you'll, you'll see these sort of uh, uh, papers, you know, on the wall, you know, your, your, your child can become a star in a week, and these sort of promises um, where, you know, you pay $700 up front and then your child gets to perform in front of so-called professionals. And some of them are legitimate, but there's a large majority um, that that charge um, astronomical prices um, for very little um, in return, such as um, there's lots of people who will pay for headshots, you know, five, eight hundred dollars for headshots, and uh, that's just a ridiculous price. There's tons of photographers in New York City who will be happy to do it from anywhere from a hundred to two hundred dollars. So there are, are there are some definite pitfalls, and what we did in the book was interview casting directors and child agents and audition vocal coaches. There are all sorts of enterprises that I wasn't aware of as an outsider. But uh, maybe explain a little bit about why, it's, why it was important for you to hire a vocal audition coach that only really specifies the songs you're going to sing at auditions. Um, well, when, when I got to New York, um, I, had, I had an array of songs that I had learned to audition, such as like Gary, Indiana, or Where is Love, these sort of classic go-to songs. And um, as, I, as I began to get older and audition more, um, we realized that a lot of people had these songs. So what we did is we went, um, we went to a vocal coach who had an array of songs. And then we'd go through and we'd find a song that was in my key and, uh, or a song that I liked. Um, and then I would rehearse it a lot so I, um, so I could go audition with it. Now with audition songs, it's also very important to have them down very, very well because um, it's, it's one thing, I mean, I do it myself, you know, I sing along to songs in the shower, uh, but then when the lyrics aren't there all of a sudden, uh, you just sort of, you know, your mind goes and you just sort of lose it. And um, sometimes in auditions, um, the pianist won't be quite up to par or they'll be a little bit slower than you're used to or something's a little bit off. So it's important to have your songs 100% um, down. And, um, and then after that, after, after my voice changed, um, then I started to go to more vocal coaches, which is where they sort of train your voice and they like little tips and tricks um, to um, relax your throat and make your song uh, sound better. Well, when Henry was in Mary Poppins, that was a big uh, spectacle uh, that Disney yeah. has it put in. And there were many times uh, the kids had to cycle in and out, one child 
Henry was Michael Banks, but he couldn't you know, do every performance because of child labor laws and general exhaustion. But uh, talk about what happens if you grow when you're on Broadway in a show. <laughs> um, well, they have a, a two-inch clause um, in your contracts, which means that they reserve the right, if you grow two inches, um, to, um, to replace you. Um, because, uh, you know, kids are always growing, so it's sort of difficult for um, professional theaters. Well, explain why they oh. do that. Oh, oh well, because, um, uh, because you might not fit in the costume anymore, and then also it sort of gives them a, uh, a loophole if, um, if, like, you're difficult or they're not liking you anymore. Usually the contracts are also six months um, at a time. Um, and uh, and um, they, would, they would line us up and they would measure us on a wall. We'd all each take our turn. It's so funny because it's the polar opposite of school um, because at school, you know, you wanted to be as tall as you could. And then uh, in my environment, you wanted to be as short <laughs> as you could. You know, so, you, so the first time they measured you, you'd stand up as straight as you could. And then the second time, you know, you'd just hold yourself a little bit lower and, uh, and cross your fingers and hope for the best. Henry had a really long run as, as Michael Banks, he became very adept at yeah, shrinking sort of, down yeah. in the shoes. Being as Even short if they as were I tight, could. he was going to wear them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes kids would complain about their, about their shoes. They go, oh, my, my, my feet, are, you know, they, they hurt because the, my shoes and I, I, I'd never say anything about my shoes. I just <laughs> keep my mouth shut and whatever. I'm not growing at all. So when... Um, when vocal coaches come into the uh, equation, and dance coach, and acrobatic coach, I once saw a picture of Henry, and he was carrying this huge duffel bag, and I think you had 12 different kinds of shoes. Yeah. Um, so there is, there is a big commitment there. Uh, might want to talk a little bit about how you got into doing voiceovers for f Disney films, and, and doing ad campaigns and, and child modeling and well, still modeling. I, well, I, um, well uh, a friend of mine that I worked with on Beauty and the Beast uh, did a lot of voiceovers, and he said that, um, that it's something that I should look into. So I went to a um, voiceover agent, and I auditioned, um, and they picked me up, and then I started uh, doing voiceover work, which was a lot of fun as an actor because all you have is your voice, so you're trying to convey this message um, just through your inflections. Um, and even though you're just talking, it's, 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 it's important when you're in the booth, you know, when you're um, auditioning for something, to use your full body and to smile. It's, it's sort of surprising, actually. Like, if you talk like this with a smile, it sounds very different than if you don't. Um, and voiceover acting was, um, was always a lot of fun because you just got to, uh, you got to be uh, silly in a different way and sort of rethink um, how you would perform. Um, and then I was very fortunate to be able to do uh, Space Buddies and Snow Buddies um, by Disney, where I played a, a golden retriever puppy, which is just sort of my dream. I love dogs. Um, so I got to play, uh, I got to play Mudbud, who is sort of a surfer dog. And you know, he's like, whoa, dude, far out. He'd talk like that. And uh, it was a real shock to us when, when I got that job, because um, they, they were auditioning for it in California. And then the only person that they hired from New York was me, which is sort of shocking because California There's such is filled a surfing with surfers. Yeah. Yeah, I had never been surfing in my life. Yeah. <laughs> but um, one of the things that technology has done has, has leveled the playing field a bit. So you don't have to be living in LA or New York anymore because you can audition in your own living room mm -hmm. and send in, um, and send in essentially email in your audition. Mm -hmm. Explain how that works. Um, well, usually you start out with sort of a, um, a like mid to high end microphone, and then um, I know some people who will actually even have their own booths um, in their uh, in, in their apartment or in their room. And what a booth is is it's this sort of box that you stand in that has padding and a door, um, and it's like a little quiet um, uh, uh, room basically, um, which you audition uh, in. And um, I was never fortunate enough to have one of those because I didn't have the space. Um, but um, I know a lot of people who um, audition from home, and actually it's becoming more and more common um, as the years go on, more but and more people audition. How would people even find out about the auditions? <laughs> um, there's, there's a lot of websites, um, like um, backstage.com, and there's, um, there's just every month there's new websites coming out um, about um, uh, where, where they'll have casting calls, or they also call them uh, cattle calls, so they're open calls, which means anyone can submit a tape and anyone can audition. Um, so um, acting, uh, 
performing and auditioning has really opened up in this new way um, with, um, with the internet and computers um, that wasn't around before. You know, I used to travel to Detroit all the time with my mom when I was, when I was six so I could go audition. And now these auditions, um, you just sort of set up a tarp and you, know, you set up your camera or your microphone um, and you're able to audition and then uh, send it in. Um, it, explain about the audition songs that you don't get to spend three minutes singing a song and maybe you even want on your ukulele <laughs> show about how long the average audition song is. Um, well, when, when you audition, oftentimes um, they'll ask for 16 bars, which is a very uh, short taste of uh, a song. And um, 16 bars is just so that they can get a feel for um, if you can sing or not. And um, usually with 16 bar songs, it's good to have um, your 16 bar song, but it's also a full song. So if you sing the 16 bars and they like your singing, then uh, you can continue. And then even on some auditions when it's appropriate, I'll uh, bring my ukulele in and uh, sing a song. So I guess I should do that now. Yes. Okay. All right. Cool. Good. Yeah, so this is my ukulele. Um, I play around with it all the time, and I'm going to sing a Jason. Oh, there we go. I'm going to sing a Jason Mraz song. Hey. So I went and let you blow my mind. Your sweet moonbeam, the smell of you in every single dream I dream. I knew when we collided, you're the one I have decided who's one of my kind. Hey, soul sister, ain't that Mr. Mr. on the radio? Stereo, the way you move, ain't fair, you know. Hey, soul sister, I don't want to miss a single thing you do tonight. Hey. So glad you have one track mind like me. You gave my love direction, a game show love connection we can't deny. I'm so obsessed. My heart is pounding right out of my untrimmed chest. I believe in you like a virgin, you're Madonna, and I'm always gonna wanna blow your mind. Hey, soul sister, ain't that Mr. Mr. on the radio? Stereo, the way you move, ain't fair, you know. Hey, soul sister, I don't want to miss a single thing you do tonight. Hey, 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 tonight. One of the things Henry told me that when you're in a show and even at auditions, the dance captain will be giving you all sorts of instructions really quickly. And with dyslexia, sometimes it's um, a, a harder task to, to learn. So how does that work for you, either in rehearsal? Like with Mary Poppins, maybe you could show us something from Supercalifragilistics. Oh, yeah. I mean, when I, uh, when I auditioned for Mary Poppins, um, they had us they had us learn this uh, this dance. Um, uh, called, it's, it goes to the song called Supercalifragilistic Expialidocious, which is sort of like an iconic song for Mary Poppins. And um, 
It was, uh, it was definitely very difficult to uh, pick up quickly and, uh, well, here, I'll demonstrate why. Because <laughs> it's hard. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So it starts out like, <laughs> and so there's a classic picture of, of Henry in the rehearsal hall with all the cast, and everyone's going like this, and Henry's yeah. going like this. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know. it's in my book, everyone's doing it the right way, and, and I'm doing it the opposite way. <laughs> But that, that's the beauty of Henry. You know, he works harder than anyone else, and he got it certainly in time for, for, the, for show the show and the performance. And now that he's moving into young adult roles, one of the shows that he did uh, was the Orphan Home Cycle, mm -hmm. uh, the Horton Foote um, series of plays. And there is a scene, Henry's playing uh, a Horton Foote as a young, a young boy, and he has to go fishing and <laughs> explain how that looked to the audience and what was really happening to you on stage. Well, well, um, we were we were supposed to be having this very serious conversation down by the river after Horton's father um, had just passed away, and um, they wanted us to come on stage. And they had these water troughs, sort of these. Uh, it was about a foot and a half of water, um, and it, it looked amazing because they had lights under it. This, 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 this light reflecting um, off the stage. And uh, we, we would come out in overalls and we'd roll up our overalls. They even had us smoking these, these little pipes um, on stage where, where we had this fake tobacco on stage. It was awful. You'd cough up your lung all the time. And uh, you'd come out on stage and you'd skip down and then you'd stick your feet in this trough of water. And it was supposed to be you know, a nice summer's day. But of course, it was in a theater, so it was absolutely freezing. And the water would start numbing your toes after a little while during the scene. So you'd try to sit there and uh, pretend like you were having this great summer day with your, you know, your feet in the water. And actually, your feet would start to sort of tense up and your muscles would start to spasm a little bit. So you had to keep your feet moving all the time to sort of keep them warm. Um, and then you would have to get out of them and then, um, and then the stage would go black and then you'd walk off stage. Um, so oftentimes we'd walk off and we'd sort of slip our way off. It was a very Mr. Bean moment. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah I don't want to tell all bad stories on Henry, <laughs> but he was in To Kill a Mockingbird, and uh, there was a, a little underwear malfunction. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is sort of, um, we, would, uh, we had student matinees um, uh, uh, sometimes, and it was an early morning show, um, and uh, I, uh, and to give you a little backstory, um, I would wear two pairs of underwear. I had, I had, I had the pair that they provided me, which are these like tidy whities and then these boxer briefs that I would wear over them. And then in the show, I was supposed to run into Boo Radley's yard, which is one of the characters, and um, my my overalls were supposed to get caught um, on the fence, and I was supposed to, uh, you know, panic and then and then take off my overalls and then run on stage and then grab my sister scout and then we'd run off together, and. Um, I was backstage, I ran off, and I was supposed to make the quick change out of my overalls, and I made the quick change, and I looked down, and I'm wearing, of course, just my tidy whities not, not my boxer briefs, and I had this, I had this dress shirt over it, um, and then I run, I run on stage, the whole audience screamed, and the scout who I was playing opposite sort of looked a little <laughs> bit extra shock, and then, and then my dresser was backstage, who I saw in the wings, who just shook her head in disbelief. And, um, and actually, my mom was in the front row that night, and she saw it. And she, the whole audience, it was, it, it was hilarious. And I never made that mistake again, obviously. <laughs> There's, uh, can I just tell one more? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, it was a, the new Victory Theater, the big theater um, with Rallis Barza. Oh, that was the um, that was the Lundfontein Theater. No. And, no and that that, was, which theater was that? It's like Asking a, my mom here, I would have memory. It's about a 1,600 seat theater. It's yeah, one yeah. of Broadway's <laughs> largest. And oh, it was the it was the Hilton Theater, which is now the Foxwood Theater. That's Foxwood right. Theater. And and which show was this? Uh, this was a, a, a Chitty, 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 Chitty Bang Chitty, Bang. Chitty yeah. Chitty Bang Bang. Henry was was the little boy in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, and there's a, a special relationship when you're a child actor with adult actors, and you want to be accepted, and Explain what happened. Oh uh, well, here I'll, I'll actually I, I have it right here bookmarked. I'll I'll read an excerpt from the from the book. All right, here we go. Okay. I made 
Henry tell me all the bad yeah. things that happen. <laughs> okay. Every show has a different vibe, but we all try to keep the drama on stage, not backstage. I violated this one time, and boy, was I sorry. In Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, the amazing Rallis Sparza played a kooky, mad scientist father beloved by his kids. During rehearsals, Ral taught me bits of magic, sleight of hand, and hat tricks that he used in the show. He'd spray me with a water gun, make funny faces, and generally goof off all in the name of fun. One day, I decided to retaliate. I was in my favorite magic shop on 8th Avenue in New York City, and I bought something I was certain to make Ral laugh. Just before one Wednesday night show, I snuck into his dressing room and sprayed two squirts of fart in a can in it. <laughs> two minutes later, there was an announcement over the backstage loudspeaker. Whoever is spraying that stuff, please stop. My heart sank. I walked out of my dressing room to discover that even the hallway, which was very far from Ral's dressing room, smelled terrible as well. Immediately, I went to the stage manager and admitted to what I had done. Soon, the ushers began to complain about the smell. <laughs> In the seating area, the 1,932-seat Hilton Theater, now the Foxwood Theater, smelled like fart in a can. I kept thinking, this can't be happening. It was just a spritz. During intermission, I apologized over the loudspeaker to everyone backstage. Then I went from dressing room to dressing room, telling everyone I was sorry. Everything in Ral's dressing room had to be dry cleaned, washed, or scrubbed including his costumes, the new wall-to-wall -wall carpet, sofa, and chair. This could have been a huge problem for me, but Ral was very nice about it, and so was the stage management and crew. It taught me not to mess around. Whenever we cross paths, the cast and crew of Chitty still give me a hard time about it. So there is a true lesson that this is a commercial enterprise, and yeah. <laughs> um, you, can, you can get into a lot of trouble, and it's hard to be a kid, as Henry knows, and to still be working um, and have that mix of fun. Because maybe you could explain that some kids really lose the joy of performing and they, they um, well, I mean, when, stay in. Well, I mean, when you're performing a show eight times a week or sometimes you know three times a week, depending on how many shows you get to do, um, the show like does get repetitive because you are doing the same thing again and again. and um, I experienced boredom in a show very early on in my career, luckily, when I did um, A Christmas Carol, because I had, I had done it the first year, and then towards the end of the run, I was just sort of, um, I was doing a good job, but I was just sort of phoning it in. And um, then I saw, I saw a tape of, um, of, of, of the show, and I realized that I could be doing a much better job, and I was very fortunate to be able to do it the next year and, and do it again, and I was able to do a better job and do my best. Um, and that's when I learned that you have to try to do your best every single show. And that's sort of the game that you play with yourself um, when you're doing a show a lot to see how you can, um, how you can improve it and how you can improve your character. Um, and it's always a special treat when you get to find um, a moment that you didn't think that was there before or you know, an extra expression or um, you, know, you get to connect with a different character on a different level. Um, and finding those nuances is always, a, um, is always a challenge and is always a treat when you find them. One of the interesting things for me in doing this book was to see how hard Henry works. And he would show me his scripts and how they're marked up and how he would rehearse and rehearse and rehearse, even for the audition, which you get essentially sides, like mm -hmm. one or two sides maybe of, of the script and how you would have to commit it to memory and that this is not an easy task to do. And the fact that he has huge notebooks filled with all of his songs and broken down bar by bar, line by line, that this is um, a profession and it is, and it is work. Uh, when, but it's paid off so well for Henry because he's got to work with some of the really great lights on Broadway. One of the adult roles he got uh, was playing um, with um, Patrick, Stewart. Patrick yeah. Stewart in the Scottish play yeah, yeah. by Shakespeare, and maybe maybe we can say to this crowd, yeah, what, yeah, this, what yeah, you learned. I, I don't know if this counts as a 
this, the, the, this, I don't think this counts as a theater, so we're allowed to say Macbeth, because in, 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 in theater, you're not, you're not allowed to say Macbeth backstage, because it's, uh, because it's bad luck. <laughs> and so what I'm, happens I'm getting told if, off right now for saying it. What, happens, what happens if you say it in, a, in um, a theater? Well, there's a whole bunch of different rituals. There's stuff where you're supposed to... You're supposed to walk around the block three times. You're supposed to, you know, spit on the ground. You're supposed to curse sometimes. There's, there's a whole bunch of different remedies to saying the Scottish play or, you know, anyways, I, I won't push my luck this time uh, in, uh, in, in, in theater. But what was it like working with Patrick Stewart? Uh, it, was, uh, it, it was an amazing experience. Yeah, he was a really, really nice guy, very humble. And um, it was, it was um, you know, Shakespeare is such, it's, it's done all over the world, and it's been done for such a long time. So it's, am it's amazing always getting to see actors go on stage and take their shot at it, getting to see their interpretation. And um, uh, uh, Patrick Stewart was very good at it. He was very um, intimidating, to say the least. He was, he was, he was a great Macbeth. One of the um, funniest costume and makeup applications Henry had was when you were very young at the Kennedy Center doing an <laughs> opera with Placido Domingo. Mm. So um, talk about your costume, or well, lack of. My lack, exactly, I was about to say that. R rather, my lack, my, my lack of costume was, um, was sort of this, uh, uh, I, was, I, I was a washed up, um, like half digested sailor boy. Um, and I had blood all over me from head to toe. It was great. I, I, I got to show up to the theater, and we get these paint brushes and sort of put this, put this blood um, all over me, which actually was corn syrup and red dye. So it was amazing. I have a sweet tooth myself, so I was always, you know, sort of sucking on this little stuff. And um, and uh, and I was wearing um, sort of a. Uh, it was like it was supposed to be seaweed wrapped around my center section. Um, and, um, and, and that was sort of the strangest costume I got to wear. And it was very cold backstage, so I got to wear this like gown. It was, it, was, it, was, it was very cool. So you see the difference in gradations of theater. Uh, back at the Kennedy Center, I know they put a blue tarp down before they started painting Henry up, but once he got to Broadway, um, your dressing room would have oh. uh, would have your robe, a robe on it with his yeah. name on it. And what I didn't realize is that they give you everything that you wear in the show mm -hmm. every day. So explain a little bit about the dressers and, and what you do after a show. Um, well, you have, you have pretty much everything. So you, um, de depending on your costumes, sometimes they'll provide um, underwear, which they usually do. And then you have your socks, and then you have um, your undershirt, because it usually gets very hot on stage with the lights. And then you have your mic pack, which is sort of this elastic thing that goes around your tummy. Um, with your mic in the back, and then it runs up, and then it'll attach somewhere. Um, and then, um, and uh, and then when you're done with the show, you come back, and, ev and everything's labeled. It has your 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 um, your initials on it. Um, and then you put it in this little Ziploc um, like bag. It's not Ziploc. It's sort of a fabric bag. Um, and then you give it to your dresser, or you throw it in the dirty laundry basket, and then they wash it. And then the next show, you have clean clean undergarments. And so everything's all, all done for you. I wanted to jump back to an agent, because I think that that's a question a lot of parents have. Does my child need an agent, and how soon, and what age, and do they really need them now that you can audition, essentially, from home? Um, well, it really depends on, um, on where you are and how, and how invested you are into the field. I mean, I, I didn't have an agent um, for the beginning of my career. And um, I went to a lot of open calls and cattle calls, um, and um, and uh, and uh, it was a it was it was a really great experience because I got to I got to start from nowhere and then work my way up. Um, but now with electronic submissions and everything, you can audition for a lot of things without um, without having an agent. But then um, once you start getting into the unions like SAG-AFTRA and Equity, um, then it's more common um, to uh, go out agent hunting and find yourself an agent to represent you. Um, so Explain um, about the first cattle call I think you went on in Washington, which was done by the, the Washington theaters, had an open day once a year where all of the mm. artistic directors would come and watch. And, and what you sang that day? Um, well, I, um, it, I, uh, I was the only kid there. And um, I showed up, and I was very nervous because I was around a bunch of adults. Um, and I got my song ready, which was uh, "Where Is Love" at the time. And then I also had a um, I had a monologue, which I which I believe was um, 
uh, which was bur which was a Burger King monologue talking to my 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 imaginary friend about how much I loved Burger King, um, and I got up on stage and you have a certain amount of time. I think you had five minutes or something, that probably less than that, three or something, and um, you get on stage and you do your little bit um, and then you'd leave and it was funny before before you do it you all line up on stage and it was you know person 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 tiny person 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 um, and then um, I did my audition and um, I walked off and then the person who was coming on after me was like how how can I follow that <laughs> Because they were so enchanted, yeah. so there is there is definitely an advantage with being young, and wanting to be in this field. Uh, why don't you talk about some of the um, expert instruction you've gotten from the coaches and, and what you've learned from them? Um, well, I mean, when I when I started out acting, I I, I didn't really know anything about it, and um, I could sing. I had a I had a good ear, but actually, well. Actually, I should start at the beginning. I failed music when I was a kid. My music teacher gave me uh, a whatever the equivalent of an F was because in my music class, I wasn't good at reading, so I couldn't follow the bouncing ball. Um, so that was, uh, that, that was where I started, and I worked my way up from there. Um, and um, with coaches, it was, always, it was always impressive what little tips and little tricks that they could give you um, to... Um, to, to, to make your life easier and to make your auditions um, more uh, uh, more like fluid, um, you know there was just an array of people uh, who had been devoting their lives to you know tap or ballet or jazz or these sort of skills who could really impart an incredible amount of information uh, very quickly. I, I I actually recorded some of my um, some of my dance lessons and it's really great getting to look back on them and seeing and seeing the mistakes and seeing where I was then and then getting to see the transition to where I am now. I, w I wanted to say we've got just a few minutes left. I wanted to ask if there are questions for Henry or about this book. Yes. Yeah, I've got a 10-year-old who's a really good singer, um, and we live in Maryland, suburban Maryland. And I want to know, one, what's the specific information? How do you find out about the open casting call for touring shows, and how do you find about, out about the audition for the Washington um, theaters? Well, the Washington theaters are no longer right this year doing big auditions, but they're going to start doing them again, I'm told. So you want to go to the Theater Washington website, theaterwashington.org. And in the back of the book, we've got about 15 pages of various websites where you can find out about auditions. And there are several um, pages devoted in the trade magazines. You want to talk about a couple of the trade magazines that have some of the good auditions? Um, the one that I used to use the most was um, Backstage. Um, um, we used to use that um, magazine all the time. I still subscribe to it and read about it. They, um, I, I still pick up auditions from there. It's a great website, yeah. You should check it out. Yeah. Another question. Yes, go ahead. Um, what aspects of musical theater, especially, did you find more appealing and more difficult to, or uh, more difficult to learn and work on? Um, musical theater, uh, the, the 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 challenge that I had the most and still do um, is definitely um, harmony. Um, that's sort of a very uh, tricky aspect of uh, musical theater that I find uh, really engaging um, because you have to be so solid. Um, and sometimes um, the person you're singing with might necess might not be on key, so it's difficult to do that. And uh, musical theater really drew me because you were, you were telling a story through, um, through all means possible, you know, dance, costumes, singing. Um, it was just giving it everything you got. That's what drew me to musical theater. Well, I've got the sign that we're over time. Um, so let's ask, if you can ask your question, um, come up to us afterwards. We're going to be on aisle 14 at the author signing segment. And maybe Henry will do some of his juggling then. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank Have a beautiful so much. day. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.